Please take your seats. Uh, we are behind the schedule. We had a fantastic beginning this morning uh, with the president of Iceland and with a wonderful panel discussing the power competition. Um, there were brilliant panelists, but twice more than we have today, but uh, now, but uh, um, if you plan to have the uh, panel on uh, Putin's regime's resilience, you know, and the Putin's regime, um, it's hard to find better experts and better specialists than I have today, the honor and the pleasure. Of course, I uh, will not uh, spend too much time on introducing the panelists today. Um, uh, Jill Doherty. Everyone knows Jill Doherty for many, many years, and my admirations, admirations when I was uh, watching the, the CNN's bureau chief, Moscow bureau chief from Moscow, giving us the, the updates for about 10 years, but 30 years in uh, CNN now, the adjunct professor with the Georgetown University, and of course the uh, the expert and specialist on Russia, Soviet, former Soviet Union, and, uh, and the area. Jan Bond, long-time friend, uh, more than two decades ago, we've been sitting like this next shoulder-to-shoulder uh, -shoulder at the OSC uh, forums, uh, platforms, and uh, working on kicking out Russian bases from Georgia, and so we successfully did it. Uh, Jan has spent 28 years in the uh, foreign service, being uh, ambassador to Latvia. Also, he is the he is, in my view, the best expert uh, together on Russia, EU, uh, uh, UK, of course, and U.S. foreign policy. Uh, I will not talk about U.S. foreign policy and elections today. It was enough for last night night all session and. Uh, on my left, uh, on my left, uh, we have an uh, excellent speaker. Always, always enjoy and admire when Arkady Moshes, uh, the director for Russia, for uh, EU neighborhood, uh, and uh, he is also an expert on Belarus, Ukraine. Uh, he is with the Finnish Institute on the International Affairs. Uh, since 2002, he moved to to Finland before that he um, he spent his time um, in um, academia in uh, Russian Federation but I think he did the right choice when he moved to Finland but uh, he knows much much better definitely the insights uh, what's happening in Russia I will just uh, say that um, the title of our panel is uh, uh, how old Putin's regime is uh, resilient uh, uh, this is the question which I will ask our distinguished panelists to answer just for the, uh, the, the house order. The, the, I ask them to limit the opening remarks to six, seven minutes, and then, of course, we will have the Q&A. I know when it, uh, the psychological clock is uh, knocking at one o'clock for lunch, it will be hard to keep you all here, but I will still 15 minutes because we are scheduled and 15 minutes later we'll let you go to, to have lunch. But before that, uh, uh, very few words, uh, one, just one sentence, Putin kills. Putin keeps killing uh, in Russia, outside of Russia, in Ukraine, on a daily basis. He kills political opponents, he kills uh, innocent children, he kills uh, uh, innocent civilians in Ukraine, and he still, uh, in my belief, is resilient. Is his regime resilient? How resilient is his regime? Why the hell is Putin's regime resilient? And what to do uh, to limit his resilience and to lead to the regime change in Russia. So let me start with, uh, with Jill. Please, Jill, I will stop here and ask you to, to comment. Alexa, I was hoping you would um, start with someone else uh, it, because it's a uh, complicated question, but thank you, Alex. And I think it's a really important and very intriguing 
uh, question. So uh, as a former journalist, I would start with the headline, which is, at least in my personal opinion, um, I think from the outside, at least uh, Russia or the Putin regime looks resilient. Uh, I would say there are some, some signs of fragility, and I'm not even quite sure how to define that. But I think ultimately, at least for the short run, it is pretty resilient for very prosaic reasons. <laughs> so I'll kind of go through it. Um, when Alex tasked us to do this, I was thinking, okay, if I look at the system from the outside, I would break it down into certain areas. I would say, number one, the biggest difference in the past couple of years is that Putin has rapidly militarized the entire country. So you have militarily, economically, politically, and societally, the place is very different. I was there, the last time I was there was, in fact, in February 2022, when the invasion happened, and I have not been back uh, since. I probably won't be back for a long time, but it, it is a different place from what I can tell and from talking with people who are there. So, rapidly um, militarized. However, I would also add that Putin is avoiding general mobilization. This is where kind of the fragility comes in, because general mo mobilization, which means a draft, you know, a major general draft for young men to serve in the military, he has not done that yet. He's had partial mobilizations. And I think the reason he hasn't done uh, a complete mobilization is precisely because they had a bad reaction when they had a partial uh, mobilization. People fled the country, um, some protests, et cetera. So th this is, the, again, there are subtleties in this, but I'll try to keep uh, to our seven minutes, Alex. <laughs> um, I would say Putin also is using any means, any means to suppress and destroy any dissent coming from anywhere. Um, the country essentially is run now by the Siloviki, as we know, you know, the uh, security services, that would be the FSB, uh, all of the, uh, uh, you know, Security Council, you could mention GRU. They're kind of an aging bunch. They're in their 60s and 70s. But that is, uh, I think, one of the most notable things right now. You have control by them. Um, sadly, I think the foreign ministry uh, is quiescent for the, for the next few years. I don't see much coming out of them, except for mouthing the things that uh, the regime says. So let's begin with political. In, um, on the 15th, so 15, 16, 17 of this month, <clears throat> we will have an election. Um, I will put that in quotes. So there is an election that will stretch over three days, which is guaranteed to provide many opportunities to manipulate the vote, but in it, we know who's going to win. Um, however, even knowing that Putin will use every bit of, as they say in Russian, administrative resources to get back in power, um, they are taking no chances. So we have Navalny is dead. We have Vladimir Karamurza, who is in prison. He's one of the leaders, a uh, very respected historian, uh, also very sick, and he is in prison right now. We have Boris Nadezhdin. Many of you probably followed. He tried to run for office. Of course, he was not going to be able to be allowed to do that. They said uh, the signatures were not valid, so he was kicked off, or actually he didn't even make it onto the ballot. Then you have arrests and prosecution of many, many people who speak out against the war or about, against Putin. But I think, interestingly, you have other threats. Prigozhin would be one of them. Um, remember Prigozhin, the, you know, um, it, who uh, led the, the uh, Wagner group, and he marches on Moscow. And then, of course, they stop him 
surprisingly late, I think, and then he ends up being killed in a plane crash. So that was pretty dramatic, and I think that's a good way of doing an advertisement that you shouldn't think about, you know, uh, uh, going against the Kremlin. So he's dead. Then you have, and th this is where it, I think it gets intriguing, the far right and the far left, even the people who support the war are now being repressed and controlled. Examples, Igor Gherkin, you may have heard of him, maybe not, but he's, is, uh, he is one of the people who was involved um, in the war in Ukraine in kind of the regions that the Russians took in 2014. Guess where Igor Gherkin is? He, I would call him a far-right nationalist. He's in prison. Um, for criticizing Putin for not being tough enough on the war. Uh, then you have on the pro-war leftists, you have this guy, Sergei Udaltsov, who has been arrested and charged with justifying terrorism. So in other words, anything in, on the horizon, you know, the radar is scanning, anything on the horizon that could be a threat, even people who support the war will not be tolerated if they get too crazy or begin to threaten the Kremlin. On the economy, sanctions, obviously he's been able to uh, keep the economy rolling pretty much. Uh, they are able to circumvent sanctions. I'm not gonna get into that. I think one significant thing is in the beginning of sanctions, the idea was maybe you can make it difficult for the economic elite, you know, the so-called oligarchs, and that they would say, well, this is too much. We just have to stop supporting Putin. That theory was, I think, kind of ridiculous. It never worked, and it's not going to now, certainly. And I would say the reason the, these economic elite, if you want to call them that, will not rise up against Putin is that he also has subdu subdued them. I do not think that this idea of uh, you know, Putin balancing these really strong oligarchs, they're not strong anymore. They are, they're subdued too. So that idea um, by Western governments that they're gonna peel them away, I think will not work. Um, and don't forget that Putin promised them from the beginning that if they supported the war, he would support them. So he is doing this, you know, taking Western companies, giving people uh, who are supporting his war, rich people, et cetera, giving them a piece of the Western pie but keeping them uh, on the reservation. Then you have some who've spoken out, but most of them ha are, you know, have not. Uh, Deripaska maybe, and Chubais left. So he's no longer in Russia. Then you have, I'm, wondering, I'm trying to race through this, but uh, it really is fascinating or, or very depressing, depending upon which way you look at it. So new laws also, to make it impossible for the economic elite to express any criticism of the war. Um, there are ways that they're um, taking property from elite people, making it very difficult for them. Um, some have decided that they will stick with Putin because they have nowhere to go. Many of them are under sanctions and they can't go to the West anyway. So the bridges are burned. They may not support the war really, but they're, they're just sticking around because they have no option. And then I think, very important, Putin is also buying off average Russians. And he's buying them off with things like social benefits, money, reduced mortgages, increased minimum wage, and benefits to those who fought in Ukraine. And this is, you know, what Arkady and I were talking just before, it's almost like that phrase, you know, the banality of evil. I'm not gonna go there necessarily, but the one way you can subdue, you know, you can have gendarmes who come and arrest you, or you can give a bunch of money to somebody and just say, don't do it. Why, why do it? Just take this money and be quiet. And I think that's what's happening. So Putin is emboldened at this point. If we look at Putin himself, Recent Russian military victories in Ukraine. Uh, geopolitically, he is now threatening Transnistria with the same playbook that they used in Ukraine. Um, geopolitically, we got into the traditional values. One of my favorite subjects, um, I think it's a very dangerous and very powerful uh, way that Russia can 
uh, uh, spread its influence around the world, uh, including in the United States and the West. I, I won't get into that, but I think it is extremely important. So um, I'll just I'll read you one quote by Tatiana Stanova from this morning that I was reading. I think it's really good. She talks about these um, traditional values and that Russia now is considered, and Putin, a stronghold of the traditional values on which human civilization rests or stands. Um, and they are now, Putin is beginning to say that the West is accepting Russia's template for traditional values. So I think now the export of traditional values from Russia um, is happening and that many people, you know, are beginning to jump on board that. F so I'll sum up. How stable? I don't think that repression equals strength. Um, but as I said, you don't necessarily have to, <clears throat> excuse me, repress people, although the repression is enormous. I think you can do it in other ways, such as providing certain benefits. And for a lot of people in Russia, getting money, as we've seen, for the men who died in Ukraine, it is one of the reasons that they keep sending their loved ones to fight in Ukraine. It's very sad, but I think it's true. Um, I do think the situation is somewhat unpredictable. I honestly, every day I wake up and I'm not quite sure what's going to happen next. I think it is unpredictable. Um, we, uh, I th do, you know, domestically, you have a lot of um, bluster internationally, but I do think that just maybe uh, the last sentence would be, and you asked Alex, what can be done about this? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say what can be done because I'm not quite sure, but I do think the danger for the West is that the greatest strength for Putin may be the weakness of the West, that any division he will exploit, any idea that you know, the template coming from Putin could be translated or exported to the West is extremely dangerous. And I don't think it's going to come in tanks blazing. I think it's going to come in through traditional values, um, governments don't work, deep state, all of this kind of soft stuff that can be very, very effective. So I will end there, I, you know, just to um, keep the conversation going, Alex. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jill. Thank you. Uh, I would add uh, some names also from the uh, Russian billionaires on the Forbes list who are in recent days living, uh, giving up the uh, Russian citizenship and uh, becoming uh, the citizens of other countries. But uh, uh, there are very few who, are, uh, who dare to criticize openly. It was Tinkov who was the first uh, to criticize, and he was stripped. Uh, of his billions and uh, just survived now living in, in Europe and in the United States. Uh, uh, according to the official uh, uh, data of the Ukrainian armed forces, it's about 400,000 uh, uh, Russians already killed uh, in, uh, in the war, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. Um, at least if it is uh, one third of that number, it's uh, ten times more than uh, uh, than uh, uh, it uh, was in ten years in Afghanistan. Uh, Soviet uh, soldiers killed in Afghanistan. And uh, uh, you mentioned sanctions. There are thirteen packages of sanctions. Uh, just recently, I saw the news that. Uh, India has uh, rejected the negotiations with Rosneft on uh, signing the agreements on purchasing 500 uh, uh, barrels, 500,000 barrels uh, per day from Rosneft. And uh, the, the uh, amount of the natural gas delivered to Europe is decreasing, but still, uh, still, Jan, as uh, the deputy director of the Center for uh, European Reforms and the really specialist on uh, Russia, uh, how you see the, the how you see the uh, uh, the evaluate the resilience of, uh, of Putin's regime and uh, what what else needs to be done to make it uh, you know, collapsing? 
Great. Well, thanks very much, Alex, and thanks very much for inviting me to this this event. Um, it, it's funny sitting next to, to Jill because um, I first arrived in Moscow as a young diplomat in 1993, uh, just at the moment when Yeltsin dissolved the Supreme Soviet and um, the, the Russian White House was under siege. And at a time when it was pretty hard to work out what was going on, you were standing on the roof of your building on Kutuzovsky Prospect, I think, um, and we relied on you to, you know, basically know whether life was going to be safe or not very safe. So, um, ni nice to see you here. Um, I think there's a lot of overlap, actually, between what Jill said and what I was going to say. But I'm going to start with a cautionary tale. So, in February 1987, uh, Margaret Thatcher was about to make a visit to Moscow to see Mikhail Gorbachev. And she convened a meeting at the, the Prime Minister's country residence outside London uh, of the best Sovietologists from both the UK and elsewhere, uh, from inside government and outside government. Uh, they were people who had been studying the Soviet Union in many cases for decades and in some cases had, had lived there for extended periods. And the intention of the seminar was to assess the changes taking place in the Soviet Union and where they might lead, and to suggest what the British and Western attitude should be and how they could influence the changes. Um, and the, the record of this discussion, if anybody wants to consult it further, uh, was declassified and released by the UK National um, Archives in 2017. And I won't go through all the conclusions, some of which were right and some of which were not. But there is one thing on which there was said to be broad agreement that I want to highlight. And that was this, this quote. The Soviet system might at best evolve in 20 years time into something resembling Yugoslavia today. So that's 1987. So five years later, uh, neither the Soviet Union nor Yugoslavia as such existed any longer. Now, I, I bring this up not because I want to make the participants in the, that event look foolish. I mean, they were incredibly well-informed and intelligent people. Some of them I, I am still friends with. their former colleagues of mine in the Foreign Office. But it is a reminder that what looks incredibly solid to us today may in fact be much more fragile than we, the, than we realize. The Soviet Union turned out to be a brittle superpower, which collapsed incredibly quickly when hit in the right place. Now, I don't think that Putin's regime has reached that stage. I don't think we're sort of in 1987, but I don't know. Um, I was very struck by the, the interview which Navalny gave, which was broadcast on the BBC a, a while ago. In, I, I think he, he gave the interview before he was arrested in 2020, when he said, if they decide to kill me, it means that we are incredibly strong. Now, all authoritarian regimes are to some extent paranoid. But I think it's also worth wondering uh, you know, does Putin have something to be paranoid about? Now, Jill, you, you talked about Prigozhin, and um, I think it is interesting. There, there are many interesting things about Prigozhin's um, mutiny, if, if that's the best word to, to use. One thing that struck me was how far he was able to get up the road to Moscow without anybody trying to stop him. People who, on the whole, had been appointed as regional governors by Putin waited to see what would happen. They didn't think, I owe my loyalty to Putin. I had better get out there and stop this. They waited to see what would happen. That, I think, is quite interesting. Now, you know, I expected that Prigozhin might suffer um, an incident with one of those very unsafe Moscow windows that uh, have, have caused so many casualties over the years. 
uh, Putin decided, I guess, to go for something a bit more um, high profile and perhaps an even bigger disincentive to, to rebellion. Uh, and the armed forces, with the exception of Wagner, remained loyal to the, the regime. But I think it was an indication that there are some underlying fragilities. I think what happened after the, the mutiny is also quite interesting because it, it went to prove that Putin valued loyalty more than competence. He disposed of Prigozhin, who had been effective but disloyal. He retained Shoigu and Gerasimov, who had been useless but remained loyal. Uh, the, the success that the Russian army is now enjoying in Ukraine has very little to do with added competence. Just a little bit, you know, they have learned some lessons from the early stages of the war. But what is basically enabling them to advance at the moment is the incompetence of the West, is the failure of the West to keep the supply of weapons flowing. And despite everything that the, the Ukrainians are suffering, they have still managed effectively, without a navy, to drive the Black Sea fleet out of the western part of the Black Sea. They sank another Russian ship only two or three days ago. Um, that's a pretty extraordinary experience. We actually should be learning from the, the Ukrainians. Now, I, I agree with, with you, Jill, about the, the ineffectiveness of the sanctions. Um, and I think when it comes to the oligarchs, I certainly underestimated the extent to which Putin was still able to determine whether they remained billionaires or, or not. Um, and uh, you know, they, they have clearly decided that their best interests are served by keeping their heads down and remaining loyal. But I think that the, the sanctions are having an impact, um, and you alluded to this, on the wider economy, and that impact is only going to grow over time. Putin is very fond of saying how well the economy is doing and how you know, the West isn't necessary any longer and Russia can do fine with India and China and other partners. But the figures tell a different story. Uh, Russian exports fell 28% by volume in 2023. Um, that, that is going to have a long-term impact on the ability of the Russian economy to keep funding the, the war. Um, it means that there is going to have to be more deficit spending and uh, other ways are going to have to be found of raising revenues. And the more that we in the West can reduce our dependency on Russia for oil and gas, and Europe has gone a long way, but it can go a lot further. But the more that we can reduce our dependencies, the more pressure we can put on the, the Russian economy. So let me just wrap up with one, one thought, because I do think this is important. I'm not going to try and forecast, as the 1987 experts did, whether things are never going to change in Russia or they're all going to change tomorrow. But what I do want to say, and were he here, I would be looking at Olaf Scholz at this point, is I think it's important that we should not be afraid of change in Russia. Putin and those around him and lots of Russian experts from think tanks that one hears or used to hear at conferences in the West have often given the impression that change from Putin is bound to be for the worse. You know, this guy is terrible, but you should just see the other people who might take over from him. Well, it seems to me that Russian history suggests that that's not a safe assumption, that any change would be for the worst. Stalin was not replaced by somebody worse. He was replaced by Khrushchev, and we had a brief period of, of you know, opening up. Um, I, I think we should stop being afraid that anything that we do to destabilize Russia is going to make the situation worse. I'm not arguing for us to promote the collapse of Russia. 
I mean, I have a son who, for reasons that I haven't quite understood, has become obsessed with the possibility that Bashkortostan might have an independent existence. I keep, keep trying to say to him, you know, look, it's highly unlikely, and I don't think you should pin your hopes on Bashkortostan's independence. But, but I do think that we shouldn't repeat the mistake that George, w, George H. W. Bush made uh, in 1991 when he went to Kiev and made the, the now infamous Chicken Kiev speech of saying to people, you know, basically, cling on to Moscow because it might be worse without it. Change will come. It might be for the better. It might be for the, for the worse. But we should not be afraid of maximizing the military and the economic pressure on Russia just for fear that it could make things worse. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. We will have the chance to discuss the uh, fate of Pashkortostan later on. But, uh, before that, uh, I think uh, Arkady was saying that uh, maybe we, uh, from the very outset, immediately agree on everything and uh, wrap up the <laughs> panel. But uh, I, I'm sure that we agree on the majority of uh, the, the uh, remarks which have uh, made here by uh, Ian and Jill. Um, you wrote in your uh, article related to the two years of uh, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine that uh, not to be afraid of the, of the end of the war and the collapse uh, because the war, the lose, uh, the defeat in the uh, Crimea war and defeat in uh, Russia-Japanese war were followed by the reforms in, uh, in, um, in Russia. You also say that um, there is the lack of the vision for how to deal with Russia now and how to live next door uh, to it later. Should Russia be crushed, weakened, or, on the contrary, offer a compromise? So, Arkady, what, uh, what is your recipe for, uh, for the, the, uh, collapsing the Putin's regime's resilience and what you think, how resilient is uh, Putin's regime? Thank you very much, Alex. It seems that there is at least one person besides me who read the article. <laughs> is it on? Yeah. I think so, yeah. But if I, if, I knew, uh, I, if I knew the answer, I would have, I would have published it. <laughs> so I'll go to this title back. Uh, and yes, in the academia, I sometimes consider it to be a weird person because I actually try to answer a question which is asked. So the answer is simple. Putin's regime is resilient. And it's very resilient. Although I do not want to disagree that there might be some things, you know, that go wrong. I know that we cannot really predict, we can only extrapolate. But extrapolation sometimes helps. So what I'm trying to, will be trying to do in this uh, presentation is to explain why it is resilient. Its resilience is based on four pillars or actually three plus one. One is Putin, is his personality and figure, but I won't go too much into that, that's clear. As for the three other things, the thing which comes down the first, number one, is actually what people sometimes call ideology. It's actually not an ideology, because ideology is usually very strict. It's a matter of beliefs sometimes. Those who studied in Soviet schools, remember we all had it across the Soviet Union. Marx's teaching is almighty because it's correct, period. No explanation. You just need to learn it and go with it. When an ideology loses an explanatory power, it loses all its power of persuasion. Putin knows that. So what he actually comes up with is not an ideology but a narrative or narratives which are much more flexible, which are changing all the time. In 2001 2 it was that Russia is a partner of the West in the war against terror. In 2004, it was already 
that the Islamic terrorism is a weapon in the hand of those traditional enemies of Russia who, who dream about taking juicy morsels out of it. People were happy about hearing the first part, people were happy, think, happy hearing the second part. Or its continuation that in the beginning of 2000s, Russians and Chechens together defeated international terrorism on the territory of Chechnya. I mean, it was not something that would have been said in 1999, even, but in 2005, 6 and further, that's what we, what we kept hearing. Closer to our times, when the war was started, the NATO enlargement was a big thing, so Russia has to go into Ukraine because it wants to stop the NATO enlargement. Nothing of the kind at the moment. I mean, if you listen to his interview to Mr. Zarubin, which happened after the, his interview with Sir Tucker Carlson, he said, no, 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 we, we, you, they just misunderstood us. We've never been afraid of, of, of the West. We just really don't want Ukraine to be an anti-Russian thing and all that. So he's changing these narratives and every time he's offering to the people something that people might agree. Because in a way Putin works the way, I don't know, he personally, but he's stuffers. Obviously hear what people are saying to each other. And then they amplify it and amend it a little bit, but it becomes acceptable. The second pillar of his regime, what we spoke, talked about, or have, have talked about already, it's the money. It's the first time in history of Russia, I'm pretty certain about that, that the soldiers are paid. Not, they're not just exact, expected to die for the motherland. They're being paid. They're being paid colossal money. Only the signing bonus is about 2,000 euros at the moment, if you volunteer for the army. And I read the other day, actually this Monday, that the regions, because this is why of the, one of the KPIs, obviously, the, the number of volunteers, started adding beyond money. So we are talking about signing bonus of four or five thousand euros to anybody who can volunteer, who wants to volunteer. That's a lot. I mean, a Moscow qualified metro engine driver who is probably getting 70, 700 euros a month. And that's considered to be a colossal amount of money. Pensions of 200, 300, let alone 400, are considered to be very good pensions in the country. So money is there. Maybe it won't two, three, five years from now. But I mean, their, think, their wish to run a surplus budget uh, has been abandoned. They're now running a, a budget deficit and have no problem with that. Uh, and uh, only the third pillar is repressions. Repressions are still selective in Russia. They're not massive. We're not talking about Stalin type of repressions. We're not talking about uh, totalitarian regime type of repressions. It's an authoritarian t regime type of repressions. We tell you what not to do, and if you do it, you will be punished. With totalitarian regime, it would be different. They would be saying, we tell you what to do, and your failure to comply would put you in trouble. Of course, the, the less attractive will be the narratives, and the less money they will have, the more they will have to rely on the repressions. But there is a boundary somewhere, we just don't know where. But this, this is a pretty serious uh, constellation of pillars which makes this regime, well, resilient. Let's, let me say a couple of words on how all this received, received, on the receiving side, people. I mean, Russian people, there are signs that the Russian people are, are starting to get tired of the war. I mean, we can analyze public opinion polls. It's still very much inconclusive, but you can read something between the lies. People are starting to get, some say, we still need a victory to end the war. We would like to, like to end the war, but we need the victory. Some say, if the government decides to stop the war under whatever conditions, we'll be fine with that. It's important, but this is not all. Because they're getting tired of the war, they're not necessarily getting tired of the regime. So going back to pre-22nd of February 22 or 24th, whatever it was the, the right date that we should go, would be okay for the people. 
I would even say, even losing Crimea, it would be okay for the people. But the regime should stay, and it should stick to the old social contract that, which was there before, which means relative prosperity, relative abundance. People do not go in and die there, but the regime can stay, and that's, that's important. And my final point is about the so-called elites. I actually hate that word, because we would need to then agree what what are the criteria for a person to belong to the elite or not. But let's, let me tell you a joke, actually, uh, to illustrate my point. The joke was originally told about Putin and Medvedev coming to the restaurant, to a restaurant. And a waiter is asking Putin, Mr. President, what are you going to eat? He says, steak. What about the vegetables? the vegetables will also eat steak. <laughs> and that tells you, that encompasses the approach. The Russian elites, oligarchs, and not only, they are expected to be subdued. And again, why is it the case? Because most of them, and that's number one, have been beneficiaries of the Putin's regime all the time. It's Putin's regime which made them rich. They were generating the capital in Russia, even if they were spending the money abroad. They were getting the money from Russia. And it's not, it doesn't have to be discussed. Many things can, can be unspoken. They know who is the father of their prosperity. So it's easy for them to stick to Putin. Of course, fears, of course, repressions can be applied, but not against all of them. If they all decided to resist, even resist this kind of windfall taxes, which they now have to pay, the situation would be different, but they have no courage to do it. And of course now, the longer the war goes, the less they are likely even to hesitate, because they feel that the attitude to them in the West is not what it used to be. They will remain part of Putin's regime in the eyes of the West, in most cases, I mean, there will be exceptions. So it's easier for them to, to hang around Putin and to stick together there. And he doesn't speak much about that. Uh, in, in the 150 minutes of his speech addressed to the Federal Assembly last week, he made one sentence. He said, we are happy to help our businesses. The precondition is that they do their businesses in the Russian jurisdiction. That's it. There were no questions asked and no need to explain, because everybody knows what he was talking about. So, they will, they will stick around him, I think. Uh, Prigozhin's mutiny, I was very skeptical about it. I basically predicted what was going to happen. Because following things on Facebook is one thing, going to the streets. It's a, of course, what I like about that is a metaphor. It's a meme. It's a tent that got stuck in the gates of a circus. That also, if, if I were, uh, I don't know, a literature, a novel writer, I would make something out of it, but I'm not. It's, it's, it's a great picture, at least. But it's forgotten. It's completely forgotten. The only thing which is not forgotten is maybe is the death of Mr. Prigozhin. It's a reminder of what's going to happen with you if you don't behave. But that's it. So, the population is maybe getting tired, but it's, it sticks around Putin. So are the regime the elite supporters. So that's why, unfortunately, I don't have a good news at the moment. And I have to, have to stop here. All the time, I, uh, we start with a very uh, optimistic, with full of humor, uh, uh, speech of Iceland's president. We start yesterday with a nice talk about uh, uh, democracies versus autocracies with optimism that democracies will defeat autocracies. But all the time we go to the topics, you know, then it's coming depressing uh, developments uh, ahead of us. But anyway, anyway, I'm uh, ready to open the floor for the questions. I see here the hand and please introduce yourself and please uh, let's just put 
questions and uh, limit ourselves to the questions exactly. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, now it's up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Olena Snigur, European University Institute. Um, yeah, indeed, uh, it was a very interesting panel, and uh, I have a question and I have a few remarks. Uh, the question is to all the panelists, uh, what should be Western strategy towards Russia? And my remarks are, uh, first is uh, uh, to analyze Russian abilities to uh, finance war, uh, comparing like according to Western <coughs> framework or to Western templates, uh, is I would say brings us to mistakes because when we say that uh, in the long term Russia will exhaust its abilities or sanctions will influence, then. It seems that we think that Ukraine is unlimited. The Ukrainian forces are unlimited. So we have to see uh, to which things we compare Russian capabilities to uh, finance uh, war. Uh, second uh, remark is that um, yes, I agree that Russian regime is very stable and. Uh, what makes it so stable? It, surprise, it surprises actually everyone that also those Russians who immigrate or who are in exile, many of them support reaching, being, living, enjoying Western style of life. They support reaching. So what do they support? They support the idea, the imperial idea actually, the idea of Russian imperialism. What is behind it? Well, Putin's favorite philosopher is Ilyin. Russian fascism. Fascist. So, can we speak about? Uh, it's it's a que it's not a question, but it's a question for everyone. Actually, uh, can we can we already speak about some kind of uh, Russian mixed mixture, uh, kind of Russian ideology, which is mixture of uh, fascism and Russian imperialism, which is right now being coined in Kremlin's cabinets, and. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking, that Putin changes narratives all the time. They're very flexible, but he changes, it's, uh, it's like the, 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 the facade. So he calibrates them and transforms them according to the audience, uh, to the recipients. But the main idea beyond that is always the greatness of uh, Russian idea. And... Uh, yeah, that's, that's what uh, actually brings, uh, makes this uh, region stable, and, and which is described also by Lev Gutko in his uh, work, Recurrent Totalitarianism, uh, so that uh, it seems uh, that uh, Putin managed to institutionalize Russian imperialism and, and totalitarianism, and it will persist even after Putin disappears. I think we have time to uh, to answer question by question, please, uh, yeah, Jill. Uh, I, will, I will be brief. Um, I think the first question is intriguing. You know, what do you do? What's the stra the policy? <clears throat> or the strategy. The other part of it, I think I would leave because it's very complex and uh, I think for the West it's very important. I think Ian made an excellent point, which is not to be afraid of doing things that are clear to, for, you know, the message to Russia should be very clear. I think the mushiness of the West is the worst thing because Putin will take advantage. That is what he does. Um, he will push, he'll you know, come up to the red line and then he'll go over it if he feels that he can. So I think absolute clarity and not being afraid of what he can do. I mean, if you look at their economy and, and really truly in, in world terms, their economy, their 
level of, of uh, existence, you know, just by average people. Um, I, d I don't think we should be afraid, and I think we should be very, very clear about what we think. Yeah, so thanks, thanks very much. I mean, I, I agree with that. I, I said it, so uh, I'd have to. Um, I mean, I think, uh, Aliena, your, your point about um, relative strengths is very important. Um, and that's why I find it so frustrating that the West that has so much greater resources is not using those resources. Um, and this is a general problem across the, the West. You know, the UK made a lot of contributions to Ukraine right at the beginning of the war. Um, it has not invested to be able to continue to make the same level of contributions and is now struggling. Uh, President Macron, at an early stage of the war, said that, he, that the French economy should be on a war footing. I don't see the French economy on a war footing. Um, so, you know, I think we have the potential to be able to outcompete Russia economically and militarily, but we're not exploiting that potential. Uh, on the question of ideology, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's been a while since I have been able to go to Moscow. But when I do go to Moscow, one of the things I always try and do is spend a few hours um, in my hotel room watching Russian television. Um, and it's always a terrifying experience. Um, and if I were exposed to that level of stirring up hatred and fear, um, I would probably be a very different person as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it worries me, and it worries me how, even in the event of a fairly decisive Russian defeat, um, you would sort of deprogram a population that has been exposed to that for years and years and years. Um, and I don't know where, you know, Russia's next Sakharov comes from to kind of put the mirror up to people and say, you know, this is who we have been and we have to confront the reality of our history. I don't know where that comes from at the moment. Maybe Navalny could have been that person, but he clearly isn't going to be now. They survived destalinization. Well, it was never complete. Uh, I just wanted to say, yes. <laughs> Most Russians have never read and will never read E.D. E. or even uh, But speaking about the instincts and Putin's ability to read these instincts, yes, the original sin in this case is 86% who supported the annexation of Crimea. And before 2014, there was no propaganda. Or at least or at the scale that we've been dealing with it since then. And yet, uh, this 86% is a reality, and people cannot walk away from that position. That's, that's the thing. So, what to do, I mean, is, is obviously to help Ukraine as much as possible. They should, the European leaders, in particular, should put the deeds where their mouth is, but they're not doing it. We, we know the answer, we just don't know how to persuade these people to act in according to what they themselves are saying. Uh, I would still try to do something as regards the, the elites, the rich people, to bring up some kind of consistency. Because some people get under the sanctions, while some others get not, do not get under the sanctions. They're not, they're not condemning the war, but they're still winning the cases, a case after a case in, in the same Britain, for example. Uh, and the sanctions are lifted. 
I'm not even talking about a proud Portuguese citizen, Roman Abramovich, <laughs> who was able somehow to prove that he, he comes from the line of Sephardic Jews evicted from Portugal in the 16th century. <laughs> and how that is possible, unless somebody is just paid for, for, for making up the whole story. But this is the West for you. I mean, this, is, this, this was, would, would have been an easiest thing to do, to put up a list of rules that unless you kind of comply with this criteria, you're never going to be uh, free from, from the sanctions. But, uh, and I could continue. The, the, the number of facts that we want to use is enormous. Thank you, Shadid. Uh, oh, too many questions. Uh, Anna, you have the question, please, after you. Uh, uh, then we have Regis, then General Chuck, then Kaka, and there is also the question, and Georgi. So, uh, we have quite a number of questions. Please, uh, good, afternoon. good afternoon and thank you. It's not on. Good afternoon uh, and thank you for the insightful discussion. Uh, this is Maria Eliadze from the Margaret Thatcher Center of Georgia and um, as an alumni of the uh, Rondelli Foundation, I often tend to reflect on the words of Rondelli, Ambas Ambassador Rondelli himself, who said that uh, small states do not have much options in international relations. And when it comes to Ukraine, uh, well, Ukraine is not a small state, but it is smaller than the Russian Federation. And one of the uh, most popular phrases in social media these days have been that Ukraine does not need weapons to survive. It, need, it, needs, uh, it needs weapons to win. Uh, so my question to the panelists would be, how would you... Do you, do you actually believe that the Russian um, Ukrainian victory in uh, Ukraine is equated to the Russian exhaustion, like there was Soviet exhaustion in Afghanistan? Or maybe we have to admit there is absolutely no coherent and clear strategy towards Russia by the Western countries. Thank you. Good afternoon. Regis Chante, journalist. I'm covering the whole region and working a lot on the Russian elites. I also hate the word. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I will pick up some of the ideas. But I think one word is missing, which is a key word to understand the resiliency, is system. What is the system? And uh, I feel it is really important. One of illustrations of that is what happened to, to Prigozhin. Prigozhin was killed, but Surovik in uh, Mizintsev, Dipliakov, and other guys which probably were behind him and pushing him to do what he did are still alive. And these people are, are against Shoigu and Gerasimov and so on, uh, not for ideological reasons, probably for money, because all of them were brought to the highest position of the Ministry of Defense by, um, by Serdyukov. And when Shoigu arrived, he just put them, put his guys, got the money, and this is the main reason why they are so upset with Shogu, not because of the defeat in Ukraine. At least it plays a key role. So this is an illustration of the system, how it works. And the money is, is a key component, of course, of this. And one remark, and I'm finishing, uh, it raises a big question, this question of the system. Right? What means autocracy? What means the power of Putin? I feel that Putin is extremely powerful, there is no point, but in the meantime, he is just an element, a key element of this... Uh, of this system, and partly his power is staged. It's a kind of mise en scène, it's just, it's a show off, and we see that on many, many respects. And it's a difficult question when we try to dig what is an autocracy, not just a, an autocrat giving orders to the population, it's much more complicated. He has to deal with it. Later. So, what could be the place of this system to understand the resiliency? Maybe the question is for all of you, maybe for Akadi Moshe. Thank you, thank you, Regis. General Swap, so, uh, you put the question and then uh, we will answer the questions and the, and the round, next round. Words, words matter. And I think that we've slipped, it, we've heard. Am I on? Words matter. And it, we, I think some we've seen increasingly slipped into, um, uh, into the description of, uh, of, the, of the war, um, more and more, uh, less Putin's war, but Russia's war. And does this you know, seemingly imperceptible 
change in some of the definition of that. Get at your pillars, get at the, uh, get at the resilience issue that you talk about. This sort of evolving and being seen domestically, let alone internationally. Again, less Putin's war and increasingly Russia's war in Ukraine. Start, let's start from this side. It is Russia's war. I mean, I was in the minority among the Russian even emigre scholars because I've been set up with this Russia's war from day one. Obviously, without Putin, there would not have been war. But without Russians' willingness to at least acquiesce to it, and now we know how much to pay for it, there would have been no war. And a point for comparison, we have, it's Belarus. If Belarusian nation is against the participation of their armed forces in the actual hostilities, it's still a co-aggressor state. It still provides its territory to Russia for aggression against Ukraine. But Belarusian soldiers, Belarusian citizens are not involved into the war. And that's, that's very interesting because this shows you the colossal difference of Russia as an imperial, post-imperial, I don't know, nation and, and the instinct and, and, and the other countries. And that's, that's important. I, I fully agree with words matter. On Sistema, it's interesting because I actually edited a volume, I think it was published in 2011. It, it, had, it took us about two and a half years to put the volume together and to finally have it published, which was called Russia as a Network State. We were arguing against the argument popular back then that Russia had a vertical of power. We were saying that, arguing that Russia did not have a vertical of power, that it had networks. But actually, maybe surprisingly, now I would say that there is a lot more vertical signaling than, than there was back then. The system is still alive and kind of... But it's also, this regime is, is really different. This regime was fragile before it consolidated. consolidated. So from 2000 to 2012, this was a period when that regime was unstable. After 2012, Putin's return to power, there was a consolidation of, of his particular regime in, in his particular, in the, the way he sees it. So I don't know if, if talking about Sistema will give us the complete explanation, but that's where we're shifting towards to academic education now. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah, so I think I'll pick up the question of um, does Ukrainian victory just consist in Russian exhaustion? I mean, I think a lot depends on how you define Russian exhaustion. Does Russian exhaustion consist, as in Afghanistan, of you know the last Russian troops marching back over the, the frontier? Or does it just consist of, you know, building more minefields and sitting behind them, consolidating the gains that have already been made. The latter does not seem to me to constitute either Ukrainian victory or a sufficient degree of Russian defeat to guarantee anything other than a temporary peace. And, and what worries me, and you know, if, if I have to read another article by Sam Charip, I may, I may do something desperate. Um, but what worries me is that there is still, it seems to me, quite a strong constituency of uh, people who really have been studying Russia for long enough to know better, to think that um, you can negotiate a deal that will stick for more than a very short period of time. Um, it seems to me that, that you need something as decisive as the defeat in the Russo-Japanese war or the Crimean war to be able to achieve a paradigm shift that, that might last a generation or more. But if what you have is effectively the establishment of a line of control where the parties have got to at the moment, I think you're just setting yourself up for another war in a few years' time. Thank you. Jill, please. 
Yeah, I'm not quite sure where to begin, but just, I think Putin needs war. I think Putin is war. His policy at home and internationally, I think, rests on war. Um, domestically, how do you get people united? You know, you find the enemy, and the enemy has morphed in the Ukraine war from, you know, Ukraine bad, then it goes to the West, then it goes to existential existence of Russia uh, with a threat coming from the West. So I, I don't see Putin ending this. I'm not quite sure what the word exhaustion means because it's actually invigorating to Putin to just keep grinding away. I don't think you have to have um, a victory in the sense that we talk about. I think you just have to be able to, Putin has to continue to be able to prosecute that war at maybe even a low level for a very long time because it's his key to support among the people. And I'd say, you know, um, is it Putin's war or Russia's war? I, there's a lot of passivity, that, I think, among Russians. You know, it's very scary to stick your head up. And uh, it, even in the old Soviet days, and, and do something for which you could be arrested or prosecuted or end up in prison. So there's a lot of, I think, you know, not so much that people say, yes, we want this war. I, I don't know what uh, all of our panelists think, but I've seen the uh, number of about 20, 25% are really raw, raw, we have to, you know, kill all Ukrainians. But I don't think it's a whole lot. I think it's a lot of Russians saying, what can I do? I'm just a simple person. I don't have any power. Putin must know what he's doing. And, oh, I just got a, a, an increase in my pension. That, maybe that's better. I think that that's more the template of what's going on. Um, I won't even get, it, get into Sistema, but I tend to agree with Arkady that it's, it's Putin. Yeah. There are very few people left in Sistema, number one. I think it's more personalized than it's ever been, and I think Putin is the person right now. It's very true. Please, uh, question uh, on the other side. Okay. So, next round is the gentleman. Then, here we have uh, Kaka and our colleague from Ukraine. A lot of questions. Um, I will come back to you definitely. Okay. Hello, it's David Dolabaritsev Please. from Georgia Institute of Politics and TSU, Tulsa University. Uh, so, Mr. Rakhat, can you consider Russian Orthodox Church as an additional pillar in this process or not? Uh, so can you consider the Russian Orthodox Church and as a pillar in this process? Uh, because I think the Church is one of the main narrative machines in this process. Additional, I, I remember quite well the concept of Svechenaeva in Nato, so Holy War, War in this process. I also well remember that Patriarch kills with it in Russian prisons and distributing some indulgations in this process. Uh, so I wonder the importance of uh, um, Russian, cha Russian Church in the process of uh, uh, resilient of Putin's region. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Aha. And then our colleague. Yes, uh, again, uh, um, uh, some additional questions to Mr. Moshes. Uh, I think that you said that three pillars are, but um, do, you, do you consider that there is also one more pillar, which is international alliances that, that Russia created? What if uh, there was no support, international support to Russia? Then Western sanctions would have killed already Russia because the supply of arms, uh, exchanges, I mean, the economic uh, cooperation, uh, Russian exports of oil now goes to India, to China, etc. So, so uh, what I want to ask, if you consider that this is as well pillar, so is it resilient, this pillar, or it can be destroyed? Because if we go to Hitler, Hitler was also the resilient regime, very resilient, and there were also three maybe the same kind of pillars, but instead of narratives, there was ideology in Hitler's case. But the country which has as a basis and the, the most important pillar is just narratives which are changing, does this country have 
a possibility to maintain long-term alliances with other countries which cannot believe in the stability of their uh, relations with them. And, uh, okay. This is my question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mikhail Samos, New Geopolitical Short Network, Kiev, Ukraine. Actually, I have a very similar question, but a little bit different way. Uh, you, you all name the, the main the strength of Russia, it's a money. So it's, in, in, other, in other words, the money is the main fragility. And actually, if you're talking about international support, the axis of evil, I would call it in Ukraine, it's North Korea, it's uh, uh, actually Iran, Russia, and we're supporting with China. But in uh, other other uh, side of this, it's uh, actually the uh, oil prices, which is uh, uh, making a possibility for Russia to gain several hundred dollars per year to, to support the war. And actually, India and China is the main. Uh, consumers of oil. So, what do you think? How is possible? Uh, and very similar question. The uh, to to broke out, to bro broken up the sexes of oil, and maybe to progress or, or in, uh, make the impact on India as the largest uh, uh, democracy in the world. Is thank you, Michael. Thank you. Now, Georgi, we will round up these questions. Then we we'll go to the left flank uh, to Julian and to our young colleagues. And I cannot. Uh, uh, with that and without uh, questions uh, from Gavin and Donna, uh, so we have ten minutes in total yeah, okay. for you. Can... <laughs> okay, I'll, I will refrain. Otherwise, you give up. I will refrain much. from uh, a speech and from indicating how many articles the Little Foundation has dedicated to understanding Russia, including pillars and ideology, this and that. Uh, my question is, I think, straightforward. Why haven't we? Heard naming and shaming the peoples, uh, people who have contributed to regime resilience in the West. It's part. It's continuation of Kafka's question. In the West, uh, that includes expert community, politicians, business groups who have been advocating Putin and cooperation with Russia, who've been proven systematically and comprehensively wrong about Russia, and who actually have been connected with the penetration of Russian corruption into the Western uh, society, business, uh, academic, media, and other circles. As for the pillars, I think uh, Akadi would agree, the main pillar is a constant one, and it pains me to say, but I'm quoting someone very important, and here it is. Um, the nation which is accustomed to servile obedience, which needs little to live and is therefore able to wage war at little cost, such nation, I suspect, is likely to conquer. That's Laurent Berenger, 1762, French charge to St. Petersburg. Thank you, Georgi. Arkady, the majority of questions come to you. The Russian church, the, the external alliances, uh, resilience of the international alliances, and of course, you answer the other questions too. Please. First, I should fully agree with Georgi, but I was talking about it a year ago, I thought everybody remembers. <laughs> but yes, people should have been punished and their names, but it's kind of, yeah. Church. No, I do not consider Russian Orthodox Church a pillar. It's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a ministry, it's a department. It's a department for religious affairs in Russia. So they do what they do. But, an interesting detail, Patriarch Kirill was absent at the Putin's Crimea speech. That's a, a level or amount of front that, that he could have heard <coughs> in 2014. Why? Because I think, I can't know it, but I think he clearly knew what was going to happen with the positions of the Russian Moscow Patriarchate or Orthodox Church in other parts of at least the post Soviet space. He knew what kind of a blow below the waterline of, of this church reputation and credibility will be because of that. Maybe I'm wrong, but at least this is my interpretation. I cannot find another one. Otherwise, they do what they're told. But uh, Russians at the moment are not particularly religious. I mean, they do what they're supposed to do, to visit church once a year for, for, for Easter. But that's it. Putin himself, whatever he's talking about, traditional values, this, that, is a divorced man. I mean, if, if this is an example, 
the people are people are not idiots. I mean, they they kind of see how many scandals that have been there with the luxury which the church demonstrated, with this demonstrated consumption of fire art. Uh, they are useful, but they they have their niche. They're not pushing the, the they're not promoting the case. They're just doing what they're told to do. The system of international alliance, they're not alliances, but they're of course partnerships. But it's it's actually very tricky. Yes, as a as a whole, somebody said yesterday that global global south is a bad term, I fully agree, but we just don't have another term. But these kind of uh, systems of partnerships in the global south are very tricky. Out of them, the most important thing is just the relationship with China. We all sitting here know that if China said no to North Korea as regards the shells, they would not have been delivered. Because China has a veto power in that part of the world. No Russia has a power of attraction or money or whatever. But China plays it smart. I mean, every time the level of, every time Americans introduce the sanctions, which can hit Chinese businesses, they comply. I mean, we just a couple of weeks back heard that China stopped doing trans transactions with some Russian banks. Of course, the story is funny, because Russia has about 300 banks. Probably 20 of them are on the sanction list, but the other, the remaining 280 are not. So then when China says, we're not going to deal with these banks, it also means it will deal with other banks. So as this is something I still do not understand, how the sanctions are done. They all, that's why they're not enough. That's why um, there are so many difficulties with them. Those who read The, the Dog's Heart remember the statement by Professor Prebrozhensky when he talks to this red guy and said, give me the Akanchatinne Bumashka, the final piece of paper which will protect me. Well, we are not going for the final pieces of paper. We, that's why we, we might have at some point 213 packages of sanctions and they, they will still not, not be working. Uh, so China matters. But, but the other relationship, it's, it's all sometimes even funny. Putin could not visit the BRICS summit in South Africa because South Africa would have to arrest him and give it to the court in the cave. That's something that he will never forget. He, had, he was the only leader who had to address it remotely because he couldn't travel there. South Africa, I mean, it's not the United States of the world. Argentina, which was thought to be joining BRICS, did not join BRICS. So the only alliances which Russia th thought it could rely on, it's like the Eurasian Economic Community and then the, the collective uh, treaty defense organization, CSTO. Even there we have troubles all the time. This is, these are the organizations which Russia funds and even with these organizations, it's having problems all the time. India, you start doing business with India, well, first of all, it also complies with some of the sanctions, especially the new sanctions, but India has a colossal problem because it's a rupee trade. What you, as an oil exporting company of Russia, will do with rupees? Nothing. You can, you can buy nothing, you can import nothing in India. Well, there might be other organizations in the state which would be willing to buy something in India, but then you need to somehow have a mechanism inside the country which would, be, which would enable, uh, I don't know, free exchange of rupees into dollars inside Russia. Or into, it's too difficult. It's, it looks like it's powerful, but it's not that powerful. That's why I, it helps that Russia has this a lot, these partnerships, but they're not the major pillar of, of the system. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, so um, I think that point on international partnerships is, is very important. That, um, and in fact, I was going to make the same point that, that you know, India has been buying a lot of oil from Russia. But I think on both sides, um, the Indians are becoming more nervous that the West will crack down, and Russian oil companies are being more, becoming more fed up with having unusable rupees. So I'm not sure how much scope there is to, to certainly not to expand that relationship, maybe not even to, to, um, to keep it going longer. Um, naming and shaming. I mean, I think there has been a fair amount of, of naming and shaming. Um, and, you know, certainly Gerhard Schroeder uh, 
has been singled out on many occasions for the astonishing way that he has behaved since he uh, left office. Uh, Karin Kneissel, who used to be the, the Austrian uh, foreign minister, um, is another one who, I, but I think, you know, <coughs> to some extent, um, I mean, for, certainly for, for academics, um, there's always a slight sense of there but for the grace of God go I. I mean, it's, it's, less, it's less excusable now, but I think, you know, people who didn't see this coming prior to February 2022, I mean, they can be criticised, but, you know, I've got many things wrong over the years. Um, it's more the ones who, even after um, the war has started, continue in the same errors that I think deserve to be pointed at and pointed out. Yeah. Um, I, I think I have nothing to, to add to what Arkady said about the Russian Orthodox Church. I mean, I don't think it's a, an independent actor. I think they've answered it quite okay, well. Okay, thank you. Uh, I apologize. Very last question to Julian Kifo. I'm very sorry. We are running out of time. I will be fired for, for <laughs> thank you, Alex. having thank this you. nice conversation. Please. Okay, I was, uh, I was uh, asking you to reflect on the part of the accountability. Should be on, yeah? Now it's on. Okay, that one. Thank you. So it's about accountability and it's about creating deterrence and if it's about Putin, his group, smaller, bigger, if it's about Russia and the Russians, Maybe we can reflect about the fact that Russia should pay. We already have this in the ICC, in other courts, in uh, uh, war criminals, so on and so forth. But what about putting on the table a kind of idea of the future Nuremberg or Moscow? Isn't it going to have some effects? Thank you. The answer is, at the moment, it will not have an effect because in order to have Nuremberg in reality, you have to defeat a country. Nobody is going to... The Western countries are not going to get into the war with Russia with the purpose of crushing it and taking these this people like Putin and bringing them to another Nuremberg. And if you just say it, you will not look credible enough and that would make things even worse. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think also it's important to leave the ICC to do the work in the areas that the ICC is competent to, to work in. Um, you know, I, I would like to see the ICC be built up, not, in a sense, undermined by doing things separately. I think there is a separate question about the possibility of a special tribunal on the crime of aggression, simply because the, unfortunately, in my view, the Rome Statute didn't give the ICC competence in that unless the Security Council agreed, which effectively lets the five permanent mem members of the Security Council uh, indulge in wars of aggression as they wish. Um, so I think there is a question over a possible special tribunal on the, the crime of aggression. But again, without defeating Russia, uh, there is no enforceability. Um, and then you, know, you have to worry about the credibility of any tribunal. I think both gentlemen have answered it. Um, I would just say, the last thing that I would say here is, um, I think it's up to Russians to acknowledge what they've done. And they've never, as has been pointed out, they never have. They have not accounted for Stalin, they have not accounted for much of anything. So at this point, I think it really is up to the Russians because, you know, we in the West can tell them, you know, this is bad, etc. Until they believe it and until they really um, very thoroughly acknowledge their own problems and move on, as Germany has done, um, we will be dealing with the same thing. So that would be my last, <laughs> last word. Thank you very much. Join me in thanking you. Well deserved, uh, well deserved.